Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeder Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, allow me to introduce myself. I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And you can learn more at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can also sign up for my mailing list. There's two different mailing lists you can sign up for. If you go to the top of the page, you can sign up for my general list and you'll get all of my announcements about my classes. And when I release blocks of times for angel sessions, And then further down on the page, you can sign up for my daily inspiration email blast and you'll receive an inspiring email from me every weekday. I also post daily over on Facebook. So lots of ways we can connect. But for now, the angels and I are here to co-create a beautiful, sweet, gentle space where you can replenish And if sleep is your intention, then gently drift off to sleep. This podcast is an unlikely mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and listening to a sleep podcast. I've been listening to sleep podcasts since 2015, and they are now a regular part of my sleep care. I can't imagine drifting off to sleep without listening to something. For much of my adult life, I fell asleep with a television. So I've always been somebody who has a TV in the bedroom and I fell asleep to television. And at some point I would wake up and turn it off. We still have a TV in our bedroom and my husband watches it to fall asleep. But I found my way to sleep podcasts, and I found that I really prefer that. It's very gentle to my consciousness, and it helps to build a bridge between my waking consciousness and that dreamy, fuzzy, drifty place that we go when we start falling asleep. And so I use earbuds, wired earbuds, plugged into my phone. And I also set a sleep timer so that after about 45 minutes or so, the episode will stop playing. And my preference is to listen to episodes that are an hour long or so because I don't ever want to feel like I've run out of content. So these episodes are going to be an hour long, give or take. And there's two parts to each episode. This first part that we're in is where I introduce myself and tell you a little bit about sleep podcasts and bring in the angels. And that usually runs between 15 and 20 minutes. And then we go into story time. And the story time is different. We, we always do something a little different. I might share with you stories from my own life or... You might go through an old community cookbook. I might read to you something that's in the public domain. Or in this episode, I know this is the favorite for some of you, we're going to be flipping through the pages of an old TV guide. Because I am a girl who grew up loving television. (laughs) So, little preview. We're going to be doing an old TV guide together this episode. And... If you ever want to just skip to story time, I will always put that in the show notes of when story time begins. 
But for now, we're in the angel part of the podcast. And this is that beautiful, sweet time when we invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in in whatever way works best for you. I know some of you listen during your waking hours, so if you're at work or driving or going for a walk, this beautiful love is still flowing to you. So when I talk about falling asleep, you stay awake. (laughs) And for those of you that are moving towards your bedtime, we're going to bring forward some sweet, gentle energy for you to help you release the day that was and come into a comfortable and loving place where you can drift off to sleep. I am someone who loves bedtime. I have a lovely waking life. But I think I inherited my father's circadian rhythm. My dad was an early riser. It wasn't uncommon for him to be up at 4 or 5 a.m., And come seven o'clock, he could not keep his eyes open. And he worked hard, so, you know, he worked during the day. But he always, you know, wound up going to sleep somewhere around seven. But he wouldn't go to bed. He would fall asleep in the chair or in the basement. We, I don't mean that to sound so awful. We had a nice basement, you know, like Midwest (laughs) tiled, paneled basement with a lounge chair and a television. So he would sometimes go downstairs to go to sleep before he went you know, come back upstairs to go to bed. For me, I hate falling asleep on the sofa or in a chair. If I'm falling asleep, I want to be in bed. So last night around 730, I just could not keep my eyes open. And so I crawled in bed early and I read on my phone a little bit. I wasn't quite ready for sleep. But I love being horizontal when I start feeling tired. So I love bedtime and I sleep with lots of blankets. It's cold here, not not Midwest cold, just Northern California cold and pillows. And it's such a snuggly place. So I send you beautiful, cozy, snuggly vibes. And I welcome the angels here. And, and I experience the angels as beautiful, loving divine beings of light that we all have. And they help to amplify our connection with divine love, which is a beautiful elixir. It is, it is home. It is a presence that is always available to us. It's just that as we go through our human experience, we are distracted from it. We don't know that it exists. We forget about it. I forget too. So that's why I always bring this to you so that we can remember together. So I invite you to get cozy and comfortable in whatever way works best for you. And I'm going to bring the angels in. They're already here, but I love sharing the ritual with you. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. And I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love and goodness and light and joy and beauty and sweetness in service to each of our beloveds hearing this message. Angels, I ask that you help clear from us any energies we may have picked up during the day that are not serving us, that might not belong to us, to help clear us through the heart of God so we may deepen in our connection with our beautiful, bright, authentic self. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in. You know, one of the things I'm so aware of is that right now I'm moving through a time of discernment, research, understanding. 
I'm figuring some things out. I don't mean to make that sound so mysterious, but I'm in this place where I feel kind of confused as I find my way through something that's new to me. The other morning I went outside, it was garbage day, and I had to bring some garbage out to the trash cans, and it was foggy. I don't know if you have fog where you live, but here in the Bay Area, it is not unusual to have fog. And I think fog is such a fascinating metaphor because it obscures that which is right there. And we can't see it. And yet, everything is there. It's just our perspective is altered because of the fog. And I think life is a lot like that, where sometimes it feels like we're moving through the fog, but what we need and what we know is is right here, and we just have to wait for the fog to lift and everything will come into view. And that's this kind of passage that I personally feel like I'm in right now. I'm working on some new projects and they are requiring me to learn new infrastructure, new modules. I don't know how else to describe it without going into description, but that's not very sleepy, so I'll be a little ambiguous. And I don't like not knowing things. I love knowing. Love it. I love when I know something. (laughs) Like I know how to do something. I figured something out and I'm on the other side of that clumsy feeling of, I don't know how this thing works and I'm frustrated. So I offer to you that maybe you're moving through a similar experience where maybe you're feeling like the fog has settled a little bit around you, but it will clear and your milestones and the things that make sense and what you need will be made visible to you and be made available to you as well. So I invite you to take a deep breath in and out. And and so whatever it is that you might be feeling this way about, just release it for right now and, and give it over to the angels. Allow the angels to orchestrate things in your favor. Allow them to help clear the way and bring you clarity and inspiration and ease and goodness. And whatever your it is, whether it is confusion or sadness or frustration, or whatever those colors of the emotional rainbow that we feel that sometimes make us feel weighted down. Let's just give that over to the angels. You can always take it back, but for now, let's let the angels carry that for us and sort it out. And perhaps when you wake up in the morning, things will feel lighter and you'll have greater clarity. That's one of my favorite things to ask the angels for help with is clarity. Angels help me find my way. Angels help make this easy. Let's make this easy. One of the things I'm doing right now is I have come back to daily journaling. I'm offering a class called messages of light and the angels have invited me to come back to daily journaling for four weeks and to journal with them to help gain clarity and inspiration and so I was guided to create a class around this and I've invited others to join me in this process and That's one of the things I'm doing right now is angels help make this easy 
bring me clarity and one of the things I was writing and that came forward is the angel said focus on delight focus on delight and what delights you and how you want to bring delight to others and I love that invitation because I am someone who loves that vibration of delightfulness there's just a lightness of spirit that comes with it so I love asking the angels for help because I get these little drops of inspiration and guidance that help to shift my perspective of whatever it is that I'm navigating. And clearly, if delightfulness is my answer, I am not navigating something that's really heavy. So if you are navigating something that is much more substantial than what I'm going through, delightfulness may not be your answer. Your answer may be something different. It's not a one-size-fits-all answer. Although, the idea of bringing more delight and delightfulness into your life sounds lovely to you. Feel free to ask for that. Maybe we can do this together. Angels, bring each of us a beautiful dose of delight. Delightfulness and joy and lightness of spirit in whatever way is in alignment with our highest and best good. And dear ones, just breathe. Let's breathe together. And open our hearts to receive the love that is flowing to us now. The angels want to remind you that you are precious in this world. That you are a big, beautiful soul and there is goodness here for you. I can feel their joy flowing through me. It's almost as if my cheeks hurt from smiling so much because the angels are so filled with joy and love at this opportunity to be with you. So just breathe and receive and know that you are precious in all of this world. I know we said this already, but it bears repeating. And so go ahead and cozy up and snuggle in, especially if you are preparing for sleep. And if you have any prayers or intentions that you wish to share with God and the angels, you can bring them into your heart now. The angels receive them and God receives them with love and understanding. And whenever you're ready, you can drift off, unless you are meant to be awake, in which case, please stay present. <laughs> and we're going to move on into story time. We've got a really good story time. So let's move on into it. So I've already told you we're going to be looking through an old TV guide I purchased a stash of old TV guides off of eBay, I don't know, a year or two ago, whenever I started this podcast and realized TV guides would make great content for a sleep podcast. So I've had a stash of these and I realized it had been a while since I had done one of these episodes. And so I went through my stash and I found this one from March of 1963. So, isn't that amazing? It's like 60 years old. And so I would have no memories of 1963 because I'm about 10 months old at this point. But I absolutely have so many memories about the show, the TV show that is on the cover. So we're going to be spending a little bit of time with this TV show outside of the TV guide because it brought back so many memories for me. And if you are in my age stage and you grew up in the U.S., I am positive you have memories of this show too. So what is it? Well, well perhaps I can start by sharing with you the words to the theme song and see if you can 
sing. I'm not going to sing because that might be disruptive if you're trying to fall asleep. But I'm going to speak the words like poetry, poetry. And you feel free to either sing or speak the words along with me if you remember them. Okay, you ready? So let's listen to a story about a man named Jed. Do you know where we're going yet? A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day, he was shooting at some food. Do you know what happens next? Up through the ground came some bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold Texas tea. It's getting interesting, right? Do you remember what comes next? Well, now the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. They said California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly. Hills, that is. Swimming pools and movie stars. And then there's a phenomenal banjo riff. And we move into the iconic show of Beverly Hillbillies. (laughs) Now, if that song plays in your head for the next two days, I am sorry. That is what has been happening to me. Involuntarily, I am walking around the house hearing the theme from Beverly Hillbillies in my head. Even the end part, remember, they would play it again at the end of the show. And it would end with, y'all come back now, you hear? (laughs) So Beverly Hillbillies was part of the tapestry of my childhood. Perhaps I watched it in first run. I don't know. I would have been very young. I definitely watched a lot of it in syndication. So syndication is when a TV, you know, a TV station would air it every, every day at, you know, whatever it was, three o'clock, whenever that was. I was very young when I started watching this. Here's how I know that. A memory came back to me, which cracks me up. So, if you remember the Beverly Hillbillies, they were always talking about vittles, right? Granny said, Granny would say, I'm going to make some vittles, come on in. And and, uh, Jed would say, Granny, those were some great vittles. And, And clearly vittles were food. And I, I am a foodie. And at a very young age, I remember going to my mom and saying, Mom, what are vittles? Like if they were so excited about eating vittles, I wanted vittles. And my mom says something along the lines of, they're food. I'm way too young to get the subtext of vittles as a synonym for food. But my mom says vittles are food. And I said, what kind of food? She said, all kinds of food. And and I'm thinking vittles come in a variety of foods. So I say, what color are vittles? And my mom says, every color. And in my little girl brain, I'm thinking, oh my God, there are purple vittles, and sparkly vittles, and pink vittles. I'm thinking vittles are like some Willy Wonka subset of food that we do not have in Skokie. (laughs) Like, I didn't know about Willy Wonka at the time, but that's the best metaphor I can come up with right now for how my brain processed what vittles were. So every time they sat down to eat vittles, I would stare at the screen to try and understand what vittles were. (laughs) I have not thought about that since I was a little girl, but when I went back in to do this episode, it came flooding back to me. So I'm sure I had this kind of who's on first thing with my mom, like what are vittles? Vittles are food. What kind of food? All kinds of food. Well, like, are they like fruit? Yes. Are they like vegetables? Yes. Are they like bread? Yes. Without 
my mom, and I don't know how she tried to explain it to me, really, I may have been three or four at the time, young, young, young kid. But I just remember thinking vittles were some sort of wondrous subset of food that I did not know about. And if you're lost in this conversation because you've never seen the Beverly Hillbillies, they had their own vernacular for things. So when they were going to have a meal, they would talk about, I'm going to go prepare some vittles. The way you might say, I'm going to go prepare some dinner. I'm going to go prepare some food. So vittles is a synonym for food. And they called the swimming pool the cement pond. (laughs) And... Isn't it crazy how I remember these things? It makes me understand why they say that young children have an easier time becoming bilingual because the brains adapt differently. Like, I can't memorize a phone number right now, but I know all the words to the Beverly Hillbillies theme song. And I remember the impression that I had of Vittles when I was three or four years old. Mines are crazy, wondrous things. So on the TV guide, there is a picture of Buddy Epson and Donna Douglas, who played Ellie Mae. So Buddy Epson plays Jed Clampett and Donna Douglas plays Ellie Mae. And there's an article about Donna Douglas in the TV guide but I do not have permission to share that article with you. Otherwise, I would read it to you. But what is in public domain is the Wikipedia page about the Beverly Hillbillies, which I will read to you. Something interesting that I just read in preparing for this episode. How cool is it that I have a sleep podcast and my work involves learning about the Beverly Hillbillies? is Irene Ryan, who played Granny, was 61 years old when she started playing Granny. Now, it's not that they portrayed Granny as being 61 years old. She she was in heavy makeup and played older. But I think it is crazy that the actress who played Granny is the same age as me. (laughs) And I was reading, it said that The actress, Irene Ryan, was only five years older than Buddy Epson, who played Jed Clampett. Interesting, huh? So this is from the Wikipedia page on the Beverly Hillbillies. The Beverly Hillbillies is an American television sitcom that was broadcast on CBS from 1962 to 1971, which is why... I know it so well. That was my prime TV viewing years as a child. It had an ensemble cast featuring Buddy Epson, Irene Ryan, Donna Douglas, and Max Baer Jr. as the Clampets, a poor backwoods family from Silver Dollar City in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, who moved to posh Beverly Hills, California, after striking oil on their land. The show was produced by Filmways and was created by Paul Henning. It was followed by two other Henning-inspired Country Cousins series on CBS, Petticoat Junction, and Green Acres. How many of you remember the theme song from Green Acres? Green Acres is the place to be. High living is the life for me. (laughs) I I don't know why I know these things. So Beverly Hillbillies ranked among the top 20 most watched programs on television for eight of its nine seasons, ranking as the number one series of the year during its first two seasons, with 16 episodes that still remain among the 100 most watched television episodes in American history. So the series starts with Jed Clampett, a poor widowed hillbilly who lives with his daughter and mother-in-law near an oil-rich swamp in Silver Dollar City in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri. The opening sequence shows Jed discovering oil while shooting at a rabbit, although the first episode shows the oil being discovered by a surveyor for the OK Oil Company. 
The company pays Jed many millions of dollars for the right to drill on his land. Jed's cousin, Pearl Bodine, prods him to move to California now that he is wealthy and pressures him into taking her son Jethro along. The family moves into a mansion in upscale Beverly Hills, California, next door to Jed's banker, Milburn Drysdale. Remember Mr. Drysdale and his wife, Margaret, who is appalled by the hillbilly Clampets. The Clampets bring an unsophisticated, simple, moral lifestyle to the wealthy and sometimes superficial community. And Miss Hathaway, Miss Hathaway, Mr. Drysdale's secretary. So we have Jed Clampett, played by Buddy Epson. Grannies, played by Irene Ryan. Ellie Mae Clampett is played by Donna Douglas. Jethro Bodine is Max Bayer Jr. Mr. Drysdale was portrayed by Raymond Bailey. And Jane Hathaway was played by Nancy Culp. I'm quite certain I have seen every episode of the Beverly Hillbillies at some point of my young life, but I don't remember any of them. I just remember their their truck that would always be piled high with things. And it certainly was part of the fabric of my childhood. So when I got this TV guide with the Beverly Hillbillies on the cover, all of this came back to me. So that brings us to the TV guide. So now we move into the TV guide. But first I had to share with you about Beverly Hillbillies in my childhood. Because I would imagine if you're anywhere within 20 years of me age-wise and you grew up in the U.S., Beverly Hillbillies was part of your childhood as well. So seeing as how this is from 1963, I may not know a lot of these programs unless they lived on in syndication. But it's also the early years of television. So often in a home, you might have one television. It was likely black and white. I don't know that even color television had been invented yet. Perhaps it had. And you would all watch it together. And you had to watch live, of course, because there were no VCRs. That would be another 20 or so years in the making. So some of the shows that they talk about here I've never heard of. Well, this one sounds interesting. So Imogen Coca, I don't know how many of you remember her. She was a comedic actress and she starred with Sid Caesar on the show of shows. So very funny sketch actress, comedian brilliant if you ever get to see any of her sketches or something if they live on YouTube somewhere. So they said that she had a new comedy series called Grindle in which she will play an itinerant housekeeper. I can only imagine that was probably funny because she was so funny. Imogene Coca, shout out to her. And then there's talk of Anthony Quinn and Peter Ustinoff, two powerhouse actors, co-starring in a 90-minute dramatic special for producer David Suskind in a plot to deal with Italian politics. So, they're talking about the untouchables. There's something about Anne McRae is to, um, gets the role of Bob Crane's wife in the Donna Reed show. Bob Crane would go on to star in Hogan's Heroes, a very strange show. And let's keep going. There's an article about weather reports, which I will not read. And then we come to the Donna Douglas article that starts off that says what Lana Turner did for the sweater and Bridget Bardot for the bath towel. A bouncy blonde named Donna Douglas is now doing for blue jeans. And they use this word I've never heard before which is the gynecomorphous tomboy, gynecomorphous, I don't know what that means, tomboy Ellie Mae Clampett, she wears in this season's hit program, The Beverly Hillbillies. So, then it goes on to talk more about her. 
So a little bit about Donna Douglas here and our word of the day, gynecomorphous. And I had to go look it up. Gynecomorphous, having the form or morphological characters of female. Like, come on, this writer is writing about the Beverly Hillbillies for TV Guide. And they have to show off their vocabulary by using the word gynecomorphous, which I am sure most people do not use in regular conversation in 1963. I will just read one little part from this article. It says, Miss Douglas says I'm simpler now than I ever was. And home is a small working girl's apartment overlooking a driveway in a low rent district of Hollywood where she lives quietly surrounded by a clutch of huge stuffed animals, tables covered with ceramic figures, piles of books, vases, and a large planter stocked with bright artificial flowers. So just some insight into where she was in 1963. Then there's an article about the water, and it says our sports expert yearns for the good old days when water was mostly for drinking. But this is why I'm sharing it with you. The first sentence says, essentially, Piscivorous, which is to say a fish eater. They're talking about sharks. Like, why are they using these words? <laughs> it's TV guide. All right, then there is a little article about which shows have been renewed already, which include the Beverly Hillbillies, The Lucy Show, Jackie Gleason's American Scene Magazine, The Nurses, The Virginian, The Eleventh Hour, and The Jack Parr Show, and McHale's Navy in Combat. I only know a handful of those. And then it looks like Victor um, Borgia and Carol Burnett individually each had their own special, and they really liked Carol Burnett's, but not Victor Borgia's. Okay, so we are now into the television programming for the week of March 9th, 1963. Starts at Saturday morning, 5 a.m. There is a movie called Murder in the Fleet with Robert Taylor and Gene Parker. The Girls of the Road with Anne Dvorak and Bruce Bennett. And a bunch of other movies. Let's see, we do get into children's programming. We have Mr. Wizard on at 8 a.m. And Hop Along Cassidy, Captain Kangaroo. I loved Captain Kangaroo growing up. The captain and gang celebrate Mr. Green Jean's birthday. I loved Mr. Green Jean's. And then there's Sherry Lewis. Ooh, color TV did exist because there's a box that says color. Comedian Sammy Smith and Paul Kaplan guest. An aggressive young man, Paul is threatening to put the old taffy man, Sammy, out of business. That sounds kind of heavy for Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. Something called King Leonardo that I don't know. More movies. Alvin and the Chipmunks. Loved me some Alvin and the Chipmunks. Rin Tin Tin, which I never got into, even as a kid, and there was a dog involved. Mighty Mouse. I loved Mighty Mouse. Also airing is Make Room for Daddy with Danny Thomas. Top Cat. I remember that cartoon. Beanie and Cecil. I think they were puppets, right? It was a puppet show. So even though I wasn't watching these because I'm, you know, 10 months old, these were definitely part of my childhood. My Friend Flicka. Oh, I got excited. Angel talk. But it's about the um, the baseball team, the Angels, because <laughs> this is actually a Los Angeles version of TV Guide. And the Angels were playing Houston. Okay, Saturday afternoon, you have the option of watching a lot of sports or movies. So one of the movies is Looking for Trouble, which involves Spencer Tracy. So if Spencer Tracy's in it, it's watchable for sure. And 
um, The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo from 1935, which I've never heard of before. You can watch golf. Oh my God. Golf. Never. That was always the worst when there was nothing on but golf and some bad movie, you know, because as a kid, you could only watch what was on. You were at the mercy of whatever was on the television. And there's swim championships. There's two golf games. There's the challenge golf and all-star golf. So two of the, what, 10 stations were showing golf. <laughs> How awful. Oh, and then a show called Agriculture USA. You just know that was riveting. Ventura College students questioned Dr. Robert Cassidy, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Animal Research Section. Oh, good. Oh, and then we have bowling. <laughs> bowling or golf or watching an agriculture special. Is there anything here we would have wanted to watch? Well, there's the, a repertoire workshop. Dr. Arthur Friedman of UCLA introduces A Thing of Beauty, a one-act play. As a kid, forget it. A movie called Yellow Neck, Five Deserters from the Confederate Army from 1955. It would have been dismal. We would have been playing a game. It's March. Well, I'm too young to do anything. I just mean if I was a child, this would have been dismal. Dismal. More sports, more sports, always sports on Saturdays and Sundays. Wild Kingdom finally comes on at four o'clock. And it's about bobcats, lions, tigers, and jaguars, about the cat family, which I would have been interested in. Again, not in 1963, but give me a couple years and that would have been programming I would have wanted to watch. We have horse racing again, wouldn't have ever been interested in that. Ski jumping championships. So skiing was one of those sports as a child that could be mildly interesting because people were, you know, flipping and flopping and sliding. And oh, and then there's a TV bowling tournament. Bowling, golfing. Just, just sad. <laughs> Oh, here's, here's a good movie from 1958, War of the Satellites. Dr. Van Ponder receives a warning from outer space to cease all space exploration or else. Okay, that would have been very 1963, right? Okay, and then there's a lot of things I don't know. Tarzan's Magic Fountain, because, you know, there was always a Tarzan movie, or Son of Frankenstein with Basil Rathbone. Boris Karloff and Bella Lugosi, a classic. We've Lawrence Welk, because Lawrence Welk was definitely big in that age. A lot of news. Something called Frontier Circus, a Western. The race, the circus is setting up at Grand Island, Nebraska, but the usual mob of eager kids is missing. Oh, sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges is airing. Jackie Gleason's show is on, so Jackie's guests include comedian Rip Taylor and the veteran comedy team of Jack Pearl, Baron Munchausen, and Cliff Hall, who do one of their old radio routines with the June Taylor dancers. The Flintstones is on. So Flintstones was a primetime series. It was not a Saturday morning cartoon. They were a primetime series. We also know the theme song of that one, right? Flintstones. Meet the Flintstones. They're a modern Stone Age family from the town of Bedrock. <laughs> They're a place, or it's a place right out of history. Okay. Anyways, some Flintstones. And this is the episode now that Wilma is home from the hospital with baby daughter Pebbles, her mother hires a nurse. Oh, Pebbles, she was so cute. And then there's shows I've never heard of. Sam Benedict with Eddie Albert. Yancey Derringer. I don't know what that is. 
a movie called Strange Tales Man Beast. Dun dun dun. A, a, a mountain climbing expedition goes into the Himalayas after the abominable snowman. Okay, abominable, abominable snowman. Could be good. A bunch of shows I've never heard of before. Oh, Joey Bishop has a show. Joey B- Bishop was a comedian, so the baby formula. Joey's straight A record at the expectant father's school must now meet the test. Ellie has to keep a doctor's appointment and leaves Joey in charge of a neighbor's infant. Okay, and then you just know hilarity ensues. Okay, the, the movies include Daughter of Dr. Jekyll from 1957 another movie called In Love and War from 1958 which involves Robert Wagner so he was always lovely to watch he's a very handsome guy oh and Gunsmoke is on at 10 o'clock so outlaws Cleed and Lucas fail in their attempt to murder Marshall Dillon but they aren't easily discouraged they hire a man named Painter to try again I think that show would go on for, what, 25 years or something like that. It aired for a long, long time. And then there are lots of movies airing in Late Night. Which I'm not going to go through. Let's go to Sunday. Sunday morning. They don't even start airing anything until 7.30 in the morning. And it's religious stuff. Unless you want to watch a movie called Molly and Me. Adventures in Farming is one of the shows. More religious stuff. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. I'm just looking for something interesting to read to you because a lot of this stuff I'm just glazed over. Oh, there's something called Change of Heart. The significance of the Jewish holiday Purim is depicted in this 15-minute film. Also, local rabbis are interviewed. The cartoon Top Cat. More movies. So my memory as a kid was Sundays were like a desert for, for television programming. There was rarely anything on that I wanted to watch on a Sunday. And this is just proving my point. There's golf. We've already discussed how I feel about golf. Oral Roberts, which is religious, wouldn't care. Folk music in the USA, I don't think I would have cared. Ethics, a discussion. Joseph T. De Silva of the Retail Clerks Union, Teamster Council, Charles Hackler Community Service, I mean, already, right? I'm glazed over. A movie called Jungle Patrol. More bowling. Pro bowlers tour. Something called Issues and Answers. Wouldn't care. Something on contemporary American painters. I mean, as a kid, I wouldn't care. Baseball. As a kid, didn't care. Nothing. Nothing would have been on. So Sundays were for reading books. (laughs) It really is the desert of programming, although at 2.30, the World Figure Skating Championship. My mom always loved figure skating, so I grew up watching that whenever it would be on. Later in the day, there is some Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins, which I always enjoyed. Golf, like lots of golf. Something about farm families. Oh, Popeye's hearing. I would have watched Popeye as a kid. But if it's Sunday night, it means we also have Walt Disney World. So they were even airing this back then. This is the horse with the flying tail. So if a horse is involved, I would have been interested. There is something called Polka Parade. Maverick, which I think I had seen at some point in syndication. Lassie, I loved Lassie. 
Lassie was a dog and I loved everything with dogs. And it was in color. This is part four, the journey. Timmy builds a raft, hoping to follow the river back to civilization. So apparently Timmy's lost. Timmy was always lost somewhere. Heading downstream, he and Lassie are caught up in a turbulent water. Oh no. Oh my gosh, what would we watch? Because you know what else is on? is Jetsons. Jetsons was also a primetime cartoon. Dr. McGravity tells Jane Jetson that she has a severe case of push button itis. <laughs> Probably using too many electronics. Sound familiar? Dennis the Menace, which of course I watched as a kid. When Dennis sees the baby booties, Mrs. Wilson is knitting. As golf club covers for her husband, he thinks that she's expecting and tells the neighborhood about it. That Dennis. <laughs> More Jetsons. This one is a rerun. It is Rosie the Robot. Jane Jetson thinks it's time she had a maid. So she slide walks to the You Rent a Robot maid service and acquires an old demonstrator model named Rosie. Oh, and Rosie the Robot, wasn't she a part of that series? Perhaps this is the first time we meet Rosie the Robot. And then again, Sunday Night, Ed Sullivan, where I learned about the fabulous art of plate spinning. If you know, you know. Ed's guests include the comedy team of Wayne and Schuster, Jan Murray, folk singer Izumi Yakamura, musical comedy performer Kay Stevens, and Jimmy Roma. I don't think I know any of them. There's also a movie called Thunder Road, about moonshiners, Car 54, which is a comedy, which I don't think I ever saw, but I just know, I know of the series. Real McCoys, again with Bonanza, something called The High Road, Jack Webb, Candid Camera, oh my gosh, I grew up with Candid Camera, comedian Alan King is substitute host, at a motel, King and Alan Funt ask a dry cleaner to have their wet, wrinkled money cleaned and pressed. Also on Sunday night in 1963 is Father Knows Best. I remember watching that in syndication, I think. Blind Date. Betty doesn't approve of the way her friends make awkward Rudy Kissler the butt of their jokes. They decide to test her convictions by fixing her up with Rudy on a blind date. And Jim was played by Robert Young. Betty was Eleanor Donahue. Margaret was Jane Wyatt, Bud was Billy Gray, and Rudy Hampton Fancher. Also airing is the voice of Firestone. Guests are Anna Maffo of the Metropolitan Opera and New York City ballet stars Jacques Dambois and Melissa Hayden, who perform a pas de deux from Don Quixote. Oh, you know what? I would imagine my mother would have absolutely loved that. I have no idea that she would have watched it, but she would have enjoyed that. I Spy is also on. What's My Line, which was a classic. So Steve Lawrence joins regular panelists Arlene Francis, Bennett Cerf, and Dorothy Killigan. John Daly is the host. There is something called the DuPont Show, which is, this is a documentary. Comedian Backstage. Is a comedian's life all laughs? It isn't for Shelley Berman. As this show filmed during his run at a Florida hotel illustrates. We see Berman as the businessman, Berman as the perfectionist, Berman as the performer, and Berman as the prima donna. Ooh, gets behind the scenes there. And then there's a bunch of movies as we get later into the night. And then that brings us to Monday morning. So we only got through two days. We only got through Saturday and Sunday. And what have we learned? Well, 
we discovered that most of us know all the words to the theme song of the Beverly Hillbillies still, all these years later, I have shared with you about my confusion about Vittles from childhood, thinking Vittles were some sort of Willy Wonka-esque magical food that we did not have in Skokie. I have shared with you how much I hated when golf and bowling were on on the weekends as a kid because it was never anything I wanted to watch. All the different movies, and we also went into the nostalgia for just briefly Flintstones and Jetsons as primetime cartoons, similar to South Park and Simpsons would be today. We had Jetsons and the Flintstones. So, again, too young for all of this because I would only have been about 10 months old, but these were shows that I definitely grew up with. So at some point, we'll come back to this issue. I don't know when, maybe the next episode, maybe a couple months from now, and I'll go through the rest because I'm sure there's lots of interesting things in here. And if you don't know any of these shows, perhaps you're asleep already, if that has been your intention, because it's a sleep podcast. So thank you for keeping me company and allowing me to keep you company. I send you so much love. Really, truly, from my heart to yours, I send you love. And I am deeply grateful for the gift of you. I wish you the sweetest of dreams. And I look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you.